All right, good afternoon. We have uh, an open question period for an hour and a half. I still have a flood of written questions from the first time around that survived the winnowing from the original massive torrent. So every once in a while, I'm going to intersperse several of those with the hope of making a big dent in this leftover pile, along with taking fresh ones from the floor. But first, I have had certain questions asked to me repeatedly in private by people to the point where I think maybe certain clarifications of material that I covered in the lectures here are necessary. So I'm going to ask myself in general terms a question I've been asked in different ways by different people on a couple of different topics uh, before I get to uh, you right today. These are actual questions asked me, but so often that I'd rather start with them. A lot of people had a lot of trouble with the idea that you not only have to prove in the sense of reduce your conclusion back down to reality, but integrate it to your other knowledge before you can regard it as fully valid. Um, I was asked over and over, how would you apply this? My knowledge, this is what the question amounts to, my knowledge is in chaos. I can give individual proofs for various points, but I have no idea how one point connects to another, and I wouldn't even know where to begin. Are you saying we have to just take any idea, in effect, at random, and connect it to every other idea at random? Where would you start? What would you connect it to? And are you saying if you don't do that, uh, then the idea is a knowledge, even if you can, on its own terms, prove or reduce that idea back to the perceptual level? Now, the simple answer is, no, I'm not saying that. The method of integration is properly you should get from the time you first start to acquire complex conceptual conclusions. So you shouldn't find yourself, not that it's your fault, but it's the fault of philosophers for lacking, not teaching a proper epistemology, you shouldn't find yourself in the position of an adult chaos and know where in the world am I going to go to start straightening it all out. So I want to say a few things about restricting this task of integration as a special deliberate conscious assignment for you so that you won't feel that you're swimming uh, in the undoable. <laughs> to begin with, integration, although in a broad sense it applies to all knowledge, as a special task, it pertains really to new inductive knowledge, like new general principles, new theories. It does not apply in the sense we're talking about. There's nothing you have to do with deductive applications of principles you already know. Such as, for instance, if you know that all men are mortal and you infer from that Socrates is mortal, you don't have to do anything with the conclusion Socrates is mortal in order to pass some further, quote, test of integration. That is already integrated into your knowledge by virtue of being merely an instance of a principle Namely, all men are mortal, but you've already validated and integrated. And from that point of view, a deductive conclusion, by the fact of it being deduction, is already integrated into the sum of knowledge. Uh, uh, someone asked me, every time I add up a, my check at the restaurant, which is a process of deduction, what do I do then with the sum? I've proved it, but how do I go about now integrating it? What do I integrate it to? That is a complete misunderstanding. The, the laws of arithmetic, once you validated them, you just churn out the sum uh, of your bill at the restaurant. There's no further special integration. So first of all, restrict it to the substance of new knowledge, which is inductive conclusions, new generalizations, new theories, new hypotheses. Secondly, that does, it does not apply to mathematics. Mathematics is not the paradigm of knowledge. Objectivism is not rationalism. In mathematics, you deliberately hold everything constant but one aspect, and it's a science of method, not of content. So given the axioms, you just churn out the conclusions, and there's nothing you have to do. It's not like you take Proposition 29, and then you say, now let's see, how do I make a special connection between it 
and what I learned in algebra on Tuesday or in integral calculus on Friday, etc. Th this is a purely deductive system. It's possible because it's the abstraction of method, and it's not uh, therefore a paradigm of knowledge, nor does this pro issue of integration as a separate process apply. Integration as a separate process over and above reduction applies to the substance of knowledge, not to methodological subjects like mathematics, and to the inductive content, essentially. Now, not just in philosophy, but in physics, the sciences, psychology, etc. So that is first a delimitation of uh, uh, the scope of this uh, process of integration. Now the next thing is that the process of integration is not arbitrary. You do not, integration does not mean, when we say everything has to be integrated with everything, it doesn't mean, for instance, you hear the idea the universe is finite, and then you say to yourself, well, now let me see, I've got to integrate that. With what? Well, I know that man is selfish, so let's see how it ties into that. I know that uh, the Vietnam War uh, was badly conducted, so let's see how it ties into that. I know that apples have just tripled in price. I mean, if you go about it this way, you, you would just have to get drunk, you'd have to give up, <laughs> because uh, uh, who could do it? There's hundreds, thousands of items, you're, re you're doing the opposite of a conceptual approach, you're just at random trying to connect something to something. You have to integrate in terms of essentials only, which means that you have to know what essentials are. Uh, uh, you can't just jump at random, and I tried to illustrate that when I said, gave us the example, man should be selfish. <clears throat> I said, this pertains to how man should act. So then where will I look uh, to even to start integrating? What do I know about man? What do I know about should, about values, about ethics? And then from there, uh, thinking about man led me to social relations and so on. I, I can't chart it all out for you in a particular example, because that would take us hours, but the point is, from the nature of the material you're talking about, if you define it in terms of essentials, that should point you in certain key directions. And I would say to you, if you're starting this process and you want to know where to begin, if you don't yourself see any relevance to certain material, forget about it. Don't bother about it. There's enough that you will see the relevance of, uh, and if you miss something, uh, you can always later pick it up. It's exactly analogous to if you make an error, if you use the right method, you will find it in the course of time. Similarly, if you miss some integrations, the, even if they were staring you in the face, but you keep your mind open, you simply file it with, this is my conclusion, man should be selfish, the universe is finite, etc. I've tied it into A and B, which is all I see right now. Uh, and then you wait and just remember, you don't even have to remind yourself, just file it in your mind that way with the knowledge that if anything comes up that's relevant, you will look at the connection and you will find that the things that are relevant will then strike you sooner or later. Always remember finally that you can only do any cognitive process, including integration, within the limits of your knowledge and your time. Here's where the fact that the universe is finite can be integrated down <laughs> to epistemology. You only have so much time. The requirements of epistemology cannot mandate that you starve because you can't go to work because you have to sit home and integrate. <clears throat> you do what you can according to the importance of the knowledge to you, the degree of clarity and the fullness of the, of the knowledge that you need, and you remain open and you specify this fits with everything else I know within the context of my knowledge and ability to perform this process. I would say, if you want me to give you a bare minimum, it's fantastic to put it in mathematical terms, but integrate a new idea to at least two other areas. If you can do it to two, you've given your subconscious, this is purely arbitrary, but you've given your subconscious the message in effect, I'm not holding this as disintegrated, it has many ramifications, and here's one and here's another. You sort of lay down uh, the guidelines, and then you're entirely entitled, if you can reduce it as we defined it, and integrate it to a couple other areas, and that's all you can see, and that's all you have time for, you're perfectly entitled to say, within my context of knowledge, uh, this, is, uh, this is knowledge and this is valid knowledge. 
You see, you're here a victim of the fact that the people whose profession is supposed to be to do all this integrating and present you with the digest in one glorious brief synopsis spend their entire time doing the opposite. But then the solution is you can't be omniscient and change your own career. You just do it within the limits of the possible. If you want a place to start, I would say integrate your philosophical knowledge first within the limits of, of the possible. But your philosophy is the framework that's going to enable you to judge and interpret all the rest. So it's not a bad exercise, since philosophy, everything is relevant to everything else, it's not a bad exercise to take two philosophic ideas at random. I would uh, 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 recommend this as a parlor game. Take 25 objectivist principles or theories, ranging from metaphysics to aesthetics. Drop them all in a hat, shuffle them all up, and pull out any two at random, and see if you can find what the connection or order of dependence or relationship is. <clears throat> That's one of the things I did when I was first learning uh, objectivism. And at first, I used to come up with a complete blank wall. Uh, now, I don't mean to encourage rationalism. You have to actually look at reality in the process. But for instance, I remember one of the very, very first things like this that I was ever given was the validity of the census and private roads. And I had to say, what's the connection <clears throat> between the fact that the census are valid and that according to objectivism, roads should be privately owned? Now that, you know, in my 20s, that really stopped me cold because I just couldn't think, what, how could you integrate those two? But then finally I was led, you know, private roads, how do you defend that? Well, as an expression of the fact that the purpose of government is only the protection of individual rights, not any part of the productive economic life, such as including transportation. Well, how do you defend individual rights? Well, finally, after a long time, you get to, because man is a rational being who survives by the exercise of his mind, and so he has to be left free. Well, how do you know his mind is valid? What does that depend on? Well, you couldn't trust his mind. If you couldn't trust your senses, because the mind is the conceptualization of sensory data. Now, you know, there's a lot more links, but at that point, even on that level, you say, well, I see there's a connection between private roads and the validity of the senses. And just that much lets you know from now on that as soon as somebody attacks the senses, it's hopeless to try to preach capitalism to him because he's wiped out the base that would get you anywhere. And if you just do that, trying not to be too rationalistic about it, but just step by step uh, as, a, as a game, so to speak, uh, it is a very good exercise in integration. And it will teach you to, to not be astonished at the connections that exist between one thing and another and you'll get the hang of it. I hope that removes the guilt that I uh, seem to have inculcated from the lecture on integration. Now I want to remove the guilt that I seem to have inculcated from the lecture on honesty. <laughs> I had a number of people tell me about various bad things or things that they thought were bad that they had done and asked, since I said to be good, is to be good all the time, and to be evil only sometimes is to be evil, did that mean that they were evil people? You know, people who would tell an occasional lie or whatever. Now, there's a, an awful lot to say here, because I don't want to sound like I'm withdrawing the absolutism of my lecture. But all the people that spoke to me, just so that this is a carte blanche, absolution were not evil. <laughs> <laughs> and here are a few random observations that may be helpful if you are feeling badly over something you once did. To begin with, on regard to the issue of honesty, it has a context. There are a lot of situations in which you are justified in lying that I did not mention in the lecture. I was a, it was not a lecture on the context of honesty, but an example of, of a principle. But for instance, I think you have a right to lie to protect your privacy, even if the individual involved did not initiate force against you, is not a criminal, he's not a dictator, he's just a busybody. And he wants to extract from you some information that's not in his business. And it's a situation in which if you say no comment, that's tantamount to telling him the truth. Uh, and, and it's none of his business, you have every right to, uh, to say whatever is necessary to protect your privacy. And there are a lot of tricky 
situations in which you could uh, say that's part of the context. So you'd need a whole discussion uh, before you could know that it's the con man pattern, that there's something you want, you're not entitled to it, and you're trying to get it by declaring a war on reality and deceiving someone. But the privacy would not be an example, and there are other such examples. Moreover, and here's the next point that I would want to make, not all lies, even if they are mistaken, even if you should not have lied, even if it was wrong to lie, that does not mean that every lie involves a war on reality, like the con man uh, uh, that I cited in the lecture. Now, for instance, one girl here gave me this example. She was in the hospital. She was very uh, unwell. Her mother called, uh, who was at a distant city, and said that I'm too busy to come uh, and visit you. Is that OK? And the girl actively wanted the mother to come, uh, but she felt guilty about making this demand on her mother, so she said, no, it's perfectly OK with me. You don't have to come. And then she asked me, well, is this an example of, uh, of a lie? Because this was an outright lie, and therefore a violation of dishonesty. And does that make me, therefore, committed to a war on reality, etc.? Now, here I think it was a mistake. I don't think it was necessary or advisable to lie, but the point is this. The person in this case was motivated by the desire to abide by reality as she understood it. She wasn't trying to gain a value by fraud. She was trying to stop herself from gaining a value that she thought she had no claim to. And the only way she saw to prevent this improper imposition was to tell a lie. Now, by the very fact that she was forced into a lie, she had made a mistake. And when she thought about it, she realized her whole relation to her mother was not uh, too clear in her mind. And she wasn't clear what she did and didn't have a right to, whether she loved her mother or hated her, whether she wanted something from her or she didn't. And so the root of it was that she was unclear in her own mind what she really had a right to or what she didn't. But she, she went for what she thought would be the fairest to her mother, out of that unclearness. Now, it was a mistake, and it was wrong, and it had a negative effect on her relation to her mother, because even though she said it, she still resented the fact that her mother never came. Uh, so it didn't accomplish anything. She didn't feel any better. Her mother still feels guilty about it anyway, because you can't pretend, no, I don't really want you. I've just been run over by a truck, but you know. <laughs> you don't get, get anything by it. But it is not an example of being a, a uh, a con man, that is absolutely not. In other words, there are such things as moral errors where the person actually does something that is wrong, uh, but it comes out of confusion, it comes out of uh, error, it comes out of contradictions that the person holds subconsciously, and it does not, it reflects a mistake, or perhaps even a moment of weakness, but it is not the same thing as like the con man, which is the clear example. I am out to get something, and I declare war on you and reality. Now, this is particularly this caution. I hope you don't think I'm coming across now as soft on lying uh, or as removing the absolutism. But the thing is, it's absolutism defined within a context. And, and uh, you have to have graded estimates from this is inadvisable, this is mistaken, this is wrong, this is vicious. It can't just be, you know, any time somebody does something that a heroine in one of Ayn Rand's novels wouldn't have done, that is depravity. Then you're losing your ability to discriminate morally if, if, you, if you utter things like that. Now, I want to make one comment here about children. A lie or any kind of immoral behavior on the part of children is not as serious yet or as significant as it would be on the part of a mature adult because a child is still fluid. He's still experimenting. He's not yet committed to any uh, course of behavior. So even if your child lies, and even if it's a really bad one, you see something that you know, there's really no confusion that could account for. This is just an out and out uh, corrupt lie. That doesn't mean he's doomed to a life of attacking reality. That depends in part on his free will and in part on how you handle it how you explain to him what's wrong with it, what kind of punishment you mete out, and the general way in which you bring him up. It doesn't mean you throw up your hand and say, my, my seven-year-old just told a lie. This kid is doomed now, so to hell with him. <laughs> which is what some people apparently interpreted me when they said, you see, to be 
You, you understand? Now, I will make a confession here for what it's worth to you. I stole an apple when I was seven <laughs> from a grocery store. And I had no desire for the apple, but I was with a gang of kids. Not a, not a street gang, but I mean... <laughs> and they dared me to do it. They were all doing it, so I grabbed one and ran out of the store, too. Now, I mean, philosophically, if an adult steals a small amount of property, uh, that uh, would clearly be a sign that he doesn't recognize the absolutism of property and uh, all the evils that that would entail. But a seven-year-old is a different proposition. And uh, in this one instance, I was very fortunate in what my mother did. Not in many other instances, but in this one, which was, I felt very guilty about this apple, and I told her about it. And I showed her the apple. And instead of saying, well, you can't watch TV, well, there was no TV, but you can't listen to radio or, you know, some extraneous punishment, she said, go back to the store and give it back. And that really upset me because it was a crowded store. You have to stand in line. <laughs> and everyone could hear, and here I had to stand in line with this apple and think, oh my God, what am I, you know? So I actually evaded uh, the punishment. I found out the price of the apple, which was three cents. I got three cents, I stood in line, and I actually, my atonement for the stealing was to lie when I got there. I put the three cents on the counter and I said, I think I'm going to want an apple sometime, so I'll pay for it now. <laughs> <clears throat> and I ran out as fast as I could. <clears throat> and I never stole again after that time. So I was not committed to socialism. Now, uh, uh, you see, it's, it's reversible within limits up to a point, and certainly when you are uh, a child. Now, I think even in theory, a con man mentality is reversible up to a point, although I've never seen it. I've never, ever seen anybody who is really wicked become good. Uh, but in theory, so long as they still have free will and are still conscious and they're capable of making reparations for what they've done, I don't, it's possible up to a point. All right, those are the two major clarifications I felt were necessary in the light of a flood of questions. So I haven't been violating the fact of a question period here because I did get all those questions. All right, let's take some. Wave your hand now. Yes. A concept is a mental integration of two or more units possessing the same distinguishing characteristic. Um, it seems that, therefore, you can conceptualize the universe since it's, it's only one. Well, you could, you, how can you conceptualize the universe because a concept is two or more, is an integration of two or more concretes and there's only one universe? Well, if you thought that you reached the concept of the universe by walking around and saying, here's one universe and here's another one. Now, let's see. Well, what they have in common is that they're both, well, obviously, you couldn't possibly do that. But there's all kinds of concepts that we can form out of other concepts without having to get them from uh, abstraction from instances. There can be even no instances at all, like gremlin uh, or, or uh, uh, unicorn, where you simply combine preceding concepts and form a concept without any instances. Now, universe is the totality of existence. So you just need two concepts to reach it, all and that which is. Uh, uh, <clears throat> as against, for instance, a PhD curriculum, which is a totality of falsehood, you see. <laughs> so uh, uh, there's, no, there's, no, uh, there's no, remember that once you form concepts, you can go on and combine them and enlarge your knowledge without having to go back to the perceptual level each time. You couldn't get universe from the perceptual level. It's a tremendous thing. It's an all-embracing concept, let's put it that way. Uh, that's something at the back? All right, at the front. Where are you going? Yeah. In light of a lecture I recently heard, which involved uh, some comments on vitalism and materialism, I'd like to hear your opinion about the metaphysical status of consciousness. My, you want to know my opinion about the metaphysical status of consciousness? I don't have an opinion. Because I don't believe there's any, scientific, any philosophic way of answering what I think you're asking. Philosophy, I say, can say only this much. Consciousness definitely exists, so the behaviorism is wrong. 
It's inseparably connected to the body. Immortality is wrong. It is volitional. Determinism is wrong. And it has causal efficacy over the brain and the body that it is connected to. So epiphenomenalism is wrong. Beyond that, I don't know. I, uh, it perhaps, because th those things I can demonstrate philosophically. But beyond that, is it simply an attribute of a total? Maybe there's nothing more to say about consciousness than there is if you said to me, what is vision made of on the parallel to the eye? Is it a special stuff? Is it some kind of radiant who knows what? Maybe there's nothing ever to say about it. I asked Ayn Rand once, what's her solution to the problem of how consciousness affects the body? And she says, what's the problem? <laughs> And that's done. I said, well, you know, they're, they're, they're not, I don't know exactly, they're not like each other. And she said, well, so what? If it's a fact that you have consciousness and your decisions influence the body, how do you know there is some special mechanism connecting them? Or some kind of special transformation or x-ray? Maybe at omniscience, all there'll be to say is we have the faculty of awareness, and this is what it does. All explanation stops somewhere with this is the way reality is. Because even if you went all the way down to the sub subest atomic particles, well, why are they that way? And how do they operate? At some point, you have to say, this is reality. This is it. All my explanations go back there, and that's where I start. So I couldn't give an answer, which I have no means of answering, to a question which I don't grasp as yet even clear, which is exactly where I stand. I think it's very important not for, now, I'm not criticizing anybody who, who wants to speculate if they make it clear on what basis, what they see as the question, and that this is not part of objectivism or, or, or philosophy, but in effect, let's call it the speculations arising from science or whatever. That's, I mean, that can be fun to do, but uh, you have to keep it separate from philosophy. Does that answer you? Yes. If Americans were to carefully follow the Soviets carefully follow all the teachings of Marxism, would we necessarily fight to the death? No. It's, it's the exact reverse. There would never be any fight at all. If Americans were to follow carefully the principles of objectivism and the Soviets were to follow com completely the principles of Marxism, which latter they do, uh, would we have to fight to the death? No, it would be all over then. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, the Soviets would be all over then. Their whole way that that regime has survived is through massive transfusions of, of wealth and moral approval from the West, from the freer nations, from Lend-Lease and all the business investment on up and all the spies stuff that they've stolen and so on. Russia would be utterly impoverished, would completely collapse if the West simply stopped trading with it, and would be completely scared out of its wits if anybody in the West stood up to it morally. So all you'd have to do is say, you go your way, and uh, we'll go ours. And you'd have to make it clear that you have a massive armament. That if there was one peep out of anybody in Russia, that was the end. <laughs> and uh, once they would know that, that, would, that would, they would simply then starve, d disintegrate into primitive gangs, the better, better ones would, would simply flee. And there would be who knows what. You know, there's been eras of and countries in the world that have been just primitive barbarism century after century while the rest of the world is civilized. Maybe that Russia is so bad that if you left them alone, they'd just go back to savagery. The point is, I don't know that, but the point is, there would be no danger to anybody if we stopped funding them and giving them moral approval and meeting with them at the United Nations and having summit diplomacy with them and all the rest of it, uh, they would simply shrink on the vine. So that, w that would be the best way to avoid war. Uh, so you would not have to have war. Yeah. Now I want one question per person because it's all, and I still have this huge pile here. So, yes. John. Yeah. Uh, if could you uh, know how the North American Indians uh, were so barbaric? Well, their philosophy, or whatever you would call it, could you, uh, because they had a sort of a lack of a philosophy that their Western civilization had, could you condemn them morally 
as much as you could say, uh, you know, when white men came if they still, if white men did the same thing? No, you couldn't. Could you, your question put briefly is, can you condemn a savage as much as you can a civilized uh, uh, Western European or American for the same behavior? Absolutely not. Uh, it's, it's a com comparison to be to a child. These are, these are stunted or undeveloped human beings. They don't yet know any mode of civilization, any mode of survival or dealing but to huddle in a pack, get revelations and, and kill the other before he kills you. So you can feel pity in a way. And if you're there, you have to massacre them if you're there in your path. They have no right to behave as, as uh, barbarians as far as you're concerned. But as far as they're concerned, they don't know any other mode. And consequently, you can say they are engaged in primitive, self-destructive bar barbaric behavior. But they presumably they just don't know any better. That's entirely different from someone who knows all the advances of Western civilization and then preaches murder from the safety of his chair at Harvard, or who even who commits uh, uh, a crime, kills someone, you know, in, in a moment of passion or for a monetary gain or whatever. That's, com that's a completely different thing. Uh, in, in that way, to judge someone morally, you have to take account of the cultural context of what kind of knowledge was possible uh, to him. All right. At the very back, I see a hand. How would objectivism apply to the issue of capital punishment? Well, that's the issue of justice. An eye for an eye, uh, which uh, objectivism entirely agrees with the principle of that, and capital punishment in those uh, connection with the type of crimes that warrant it is entirely justified as a moral principle. A man forfeits his right to life when he acts like an animal or a savage. If he kills or kidnaps, and I could think of several other crimes as well under the appropriate circumstances, justice demands that that man be extirpated. Uh, so there's no question of the validity. The problem with capital punishment is that it is irremediable. If you make a mistake, you, you know, you can't uh, call a guy back and say, you know, it was somebody else. We thought we had you, and, you know, it wasn't. Therefore, the, pro the challenges to a proper legal system to institute so many safeguards and so many appeals when a capital case is involved that uh, there is absolutely no human po possibility of this thing uh, uh, miscarrying. Even then, who knows? But uh, you can't have, you couldn't live at all if you said we can't act at all on the grounds that we might make a mistake. But you do have to put severe safeguards where capital issues are at stake. But, but other than that, absolutely, uh, entirely for capital punishment. I do not believe in what uh, liberals call, quote, the sanctity, unquote, of human life. If that means every human being is sacred, including Adolf Hitler. If a man is a murderer, he loses his sanctity, his dignity, his rights, his morality, his value. He becomes the destroyer of the sanctity of human life. And therefore, in the name of adherence to uh, human life, you have to get rid of him. Another one. <coughs> have somebody standing up there, yes. Well, a dozen concepts, new, actually new concepts in the last about 12 years. Can you give us a few of them? <laughs> <laughs> you mean non philosophic concepts? You said that there were. I told you you're rather made such an unguarded statement, but I'm sure the dictionary is full. Who can think of any? I can't think of one. Of words that have come into vogue. Any word that's come into vogue. Harry, I'm sure you can. Yeah, what? Ram. Computer term. Oh, all that computer stuff, yeah. Which I can't even quote you because I know nothing about computers. But there's a whole vocabulary that's come into existence in regard to computers. Um, uh, is one example. New games, new inventions. Uh, I would suggest that the best way to do that, since, since I'm not an expert on that, is go to a dictionary that has a supplement of the last 10 years. 
the words that have come into, into vogue and into general usage since they came out 10 years ago. And you'll find them alphabetized. Now I've got to come back to a few. This one, I've decided it's now too late to answer. <clears throat> well, here's one that uh, really deserves an answer, but it'll have to be brief. Could you distinguish thinking in principles, thinking in essentials, and thinking in fundamentals, along with an example to clarify? Well, the key one is thinking in essentials. An essential is a concept that arises in connection with concept formation and definition. The essential is that attribute which distinguishes the thing from everything else. And one aspect of the essential is the fundamental. If there are more than one attribute distinguishing an entity from other things, then the essential is the most basic of those distinctive attributes, the one that underlies the greatest number of others. So thinking in fundamentals is really an aspect of thinking in essentials. And now thinking in principles is a consequence. If you think in essentials, that makes it possible for you to grasp principles. If you think in non-essentials, you are unable then to make these basic generalizations in any proper way, because your basic conceptual framework is distorted. Now here, you said, give me an example. Well, this is very brief. But for instance, suppose you define capitalism as the system of competition. That is your definition. That is what you regard as the essential. In other words, here, the fundamental. Well, if so, then the very likelihood is that the first time you see a single seller in charge of a vast market, you'll say, this is anti-capitalist. Uh, we have to have an antitrust uh, law to protect capitalism, because capitalism is competition, and here is an area without competition. This was exactly how the antitrust uh, people defended it, and defended to this day, not as an attack on capitalism, but as saving uh, capitalism. Now, there, the principle that they came to is government intervention is necessary to preserve competition. And if you define competition as a multiplicity of sellers in a given market, government intervention may be necessary to achieve that. So their principles are completely wiped out by the fact of having started with a definition in terms of non-essential. If you just start with capitalism as a system of private property, and then you say one consequence of that is that on the whole and in the long run there will be competition, but not necessarily in every field and every day, then, of course, the fact of a single seller won't even give you the beginning of a suggestion of a principle to justify government intervention, because you'll see you're going directly against private property, which is the right of use and disposal, but when you appeal to government intervention. So, in other words, you couldn't have the principle of capitalism or how to defend it if you didn't define it in terms of fundamentals. And that is a small example of the broad point. Defining your concepts in terms of essentials, which in amounts to, in terms of fundamentals, comes first and makes possible for you later to grasp uh, principles, which are basic generalizations where you use concepts to acquire inductive knowledge. I, I hope that's an answer, but I mean, this is the kind of question you have to give an entire course to. Um, and here's another one. Please distinguish between principles and moral values. Now, this was asked last week, so hopefully the answer is clearer now, but just in case it isn't, a principle is a term much broader than morality, much broader. There are scientific principles, metaphysical principles. A principle is simply a basic generalization. A moral value is a type of principle within the realm of morality. For instance, we say purpose is a moral value. Everybody should act to be guided by the value of purpose. His, goal, his action should be goal-directed. He should know what he's after, and so on. That is one principle of proper human behavior. But that is simply one example within the whole field of uh, uh, principles. Uh, <clears throat> now, here's a whole question based on the following statement. You once said that context is a type of hierarchy, and then there's a whole bunch of follow-up questions. That is exactly backwards. Hierarchy is a type of context. So that should eliminate this whole question. 
Context is the broader term. Context is the term that designates the fact that any given item of knowledge is relational. It doesn't stand on its own, but has a whole surrounding framework that it has to be connected to. Then a hierarchy is one type of context. It refers to context when that context is structured step by step, closer and closer to reality until you finally go back to the perceptual level. So hierarchy, I take as a narrower term within the broader con issue of context. So it's no wonder that that questioner was uh, confused. OK, we'll go back to, uh, yes. I understand that Ms. Graham's interest in philosophy came out of the writing of fiction. And then, Not her, true. Yeah. Okay, I don't want you to talk about story. Right. Um, and I understand her picture of philosophy was very systematic. My question really is, why did she write the kind of articles that she wrote, that is, about a lot of particulars, rather than either writing more fiction, or writing a systematized philosophy. Why did Andre in her later years write cultural commentary rather than more fiction or more abstract philosophy? Is that uh, your question? That's an interesting question. She wanted to do both of the two that you uh, exclude, but she couldn't get up the uh, motivation to do it. She was, she was interested in doing um, fiction, but she was, uh, she subscribed to romantic realism. And she wanted fiction set in the contemporary world. And at a certain point, she was so disgusted with the world that she couldn't imagine making, you know, hippies and yippies and all the rest of it part of the folks next door. You know, it would be like taking Gus Webb, who in the fountainhead was just a minor you know, wrinkled to show how awful people could be in making all the characters as she saw it on that level. And she even experimented in her mind with novels that might be realistic that were completely detached from society today. She didn't want a historical novel, but she had one idea for a novel on a spaceship where the whole novel took place in outer space, you see, so that they didn't come in contact with today's world and so on. Some of them were really fascinating. But um, she couldn't, the fact is she could not she, she felt that she could not summon the motivation to recreate uh, the world around her uh, at a certain point. After all, she had already written Atlas. She had reached a tremendous level, and uh, that was no longer her interest, given her cultural assessment. With regard to writing nonfiction, a systematic presentation, she always said she would do it when she was 70. And then when she turned 70, she felt that there would be no personal reward in it for her. That she had, she had, you know, it would be a long, long range project. She didn't know how much uh, longer uh, she had. And she also had one thing, which is the reason why she didn't go into uh, philosophy at all, which is, I mean, as, a, as her career, she was very focused on reality. She was never, could not be content with just a discussion of abstractions, even if they weren't floating abstractions. That's why she wanted to put her, fiction, uh, put her ideas in the form of fiction to show what they would be like in real life. And in the same way, she had more of a motive personally. It was more personally satisfying to her to apply philosophy, and even if uh, on a cultural level, to an analyze what's wrong with real things than to go into the you know, the very, in effect, depart from reality as it's currently real and lived and go into uh, the progression of abstractions that you would have to to develop a philosophy. Now, she didn't, she didn't oppose that. She didn't think that there was anything wrong. In fact, she thought it was urgent. But her attitude was, it's something she would have to do someday. Only she didn't really want to. And of course, she, therefore, she, did not, she didn't do it. But, um, she certainly worked hard to make sure that other people would have enough knowledge to be able to do it. So uh, this, as you understand, I'm, speaking, I'm not speaking here as an intrinsicist giver of commandments. I'm not saying, obviously, that anybody who now wants to write fiction or who now goes into abstract philosophy, which latter is myself, has therefore an inferior interest in reality. Obviously, I'm not saying that. I'm giving her personal assessment at her age and her status of life with what she had achieved, etc. And uh, you get a different perspective after you write Atlas Shrugged <laughs> than you do before.
I mean, I wouldn't know firsthand, but I, I can imagine. Um, here's a question. Why did you leave out the concept of unit uh, when you uh, discussed the existent and then entity and identity? Isn't that important or what? Yes, it's certain. Well, I'm rewording the question. They <laughs> certainly, that's a crucial concept, but it's one thing about it disqualifies it utterly from that second lecture where I was discussing the implications of uh, existence. Wh which thing? That's epistemology. That is the heart of the issue of concepts. That's the entrance to man's form of cognition. When he's able to say, this is similar to others and different from that, and therefore I'm going to form a group, in other words, when he gets the, the implicit concept unit, he has already entered the conceptual realm. But unit, the whole point of a, the objectivist epistemology, is not an intrinsic attribute. It's not metaphysical. It's not an aspect of reality. It's reality as organized by man. So it's the status of that is precisely objective as against an aspect of metaphysical reality itself. And therefore, it was not inadvertency or oversight that I omitted that. That was completely deliberate. I would have committed myself to intrinsicism as a philosophy if I had made unit the concept inherent in existence as such. Because that would mean that conceptual knowledge then is just a form of perception. I would have wiped out everything out. You have to be really careful when you make these lists that you don't put bacon and eggs along with causality. Because <laughs> now I have a, a lot of, I think, that can be done briefly on virtue. Is there a hierarchical structure in the process of learning moral virtues? Do some virtues logically come before others in the learning process? That's a very interesting question, and the best answer I could give to that is no, not to my knowledge. I don't know any such hierarchy. You could make a case only that in some terms, rationality is more basic than any of the others, because all of the others are forms and expressions of rationality. But I wouldn't even go so far as to say that you learn rationality first, because that's a tremendous abstraction. And therefore, in terms of the order, once you have such concepts, for instance, as telling the truth, you could learn telling the truth before you know what rationality is. And that would be one of the concretes that at a later stage would enable you to reach rationality. So I would not, you're already at a sophisticated adult level when you're describing courses of human behavior and ways of operating your consciousness. And I don't know of any hierarchy there. Ayn Rand told me explicitly that in her presentation in Atlas Shrugged, there was no necessity in the order of virtues uh, that she presented, and that she had never tried to work out a hierarchical structure. I've written the parts on virtue now, simply followed her order, and I said at the beginning of the chapter that I, there's no necessity to this order except that rationality has to come first, for the reason I indicated, and pride would obviously come last because it's the summation, it's the adherence to. Uh, morality, uh, the commitment to achieving moral perfection, so it would obviously presuppose that you know something about what morality is, but in between, I don't see any way you could do it. How, uh, is pride, how is pride related to self-esteem? As objectivism uses those terms, pride is a virtue, self-esteem is the value that it attains. Pride is the process of being committed to doing what is right, to achieving moral perfection, not omniscience, but moral perfection. Self-esteem is the positive assessment of oneself that follows from taking the actions of a proud man. It's the feeling, I am good, I am right, I am in harmony with reality, and I am capable of achieving my goals. And that feeling derives from the fact that you have consistently tried to adhere to reality. So they're related as virtue and value. Are some virtues more important than others? Absolutely not. You cannot say, well, I'm great on productiveness, medium on justice, and I'm a complete liar. <laughs> I very strongly believe that virtue is one. That statement that I quoted in the lecture. They are all expressions of rationality. It is an issue of principle, and they are just convenient ways of defining aspects of this principle. 
If you seriously or significantly violate any one virtue, you wipe yourself out on all. Uh, because you are wiped out the principle of rationality. So there's no such thing as picking and choosing, and there's a certain danger in, in defining virtues because it's like, uh, well, I, I get three points for these three even if I miss out those four. You have to remember always that they're a unity, and it's, a, it's, a, it's simply to help concretize. The various virtues are nothing but chewing of rationality. They're concretizing in important ways of what it consists of, because you don't want just a floating abstraction, use your mind, what does that mean? But well, once you've taken apart, you have to put back together and remember that it's all one unity. Uh, here's another one. Is it correct to say <coughs> that an error that harms another person is more serious than one which harms oneself? Well, is it, I see everybody's nodding no. Is it correct to say that an error that harms yourself is more serious than one that harms another? You couldn't make either statement without some definition and context. You couldn't make any rule one way or the other. Whom are you harming? What do you call harm? What rights, if any, in the context do they legitimately have? What is the nature of the error? I mean, you'd have to know all that before you could possibly weigh one harm against another. Suppose a person said to me, here's a choice. One error, in quotes, is I'm going to become an alcoholic and drink myself to death. The other error, in quotes, is I volitionally stood up a friend and made him wait on the corner for an hour, which is very bad non-objective behavior. Which is worse, what I did to myself or what I did to him? Obviously, what you did to yourself it's worse, you inflicted a scratch on him, and maybe the penalty is he'd be mad at you, or whatever, but you ruined your own life. And of course, this, in, in reverse, if you killed him, <laughs> you, you certainly did him a lot of bad harm. <clears throat> there is no way to, to make a, a, a principle out of, all you can say is the standard, the purpose of morality is to achieve your own happiness. So the most, the worst thing you can do is to harm yourself. But in the course of harming someone else, if it's truly an unjustified harm, you are harming yourself. There's no dichotomy. If you lie or steal, etc., from someone else, you are placing yourself at odds with reality and therefore harming yourself. But it's not an issue of weighing the harm to you as against the harm to them. Uh, okay, I'll take some more at the back, yes. Do I believe that a formalized presentation of objectivism will hasten the spread of objectivism in the academic world? I believe that it's a necessary condition of such a spread. I don't think by itself it will, it will do anything. I think if you had <clears throat> every proposition in objectivism as the subject of a separate encyclopedia, and you brought in something that would make uh, the critique of pure reason uh, look like a Reader's Digest article <coughs> in brevity and popularity, that would not change the status of the universities. All that it would do is remove one rationalization. They could no longer say you don't have a technical development. So the point, however, of writing such a presentation is not to get past the dishonest mentalities today. The point is to arm a new generation with the kind of detailed knowledge they'd have to have so they can then fight or argue or write their ways in in, in the course of time. But just coming with the presentation is not going to do it. You, you have to entirely bypass the present generation and try to educate. But educate, here you're talking about seriously educating professionals. And they have to know, therefore, all of the kinds of questions that are being asked here, because they're going to be asked these and 10,000 more on the first job interview in some form or another. And if they can't hold their own, you know, they'll just, they won't get in. So the idea is to educate a whole generation. That is, so I wouldn't say it hasten anything. It just remove one obstacle, that's all. 
I've, at my age, I've given up haste. There is no haste anymore. I mean, wh whatever it's going, to, it's going to be after I'm dead, so I can no longer think in terms of how fast or how slow. You just go on. <clears throat> what is the difference between an idea, a concept, and a notion? Now, uh, philosophy is not the same as lexicography. I give you a definition of the key terms that are essential in philosophy. This is more a linguistic question. You can look up a good uh, thesaurus or a dictionary of synonyms. I will simply tell you that as I or as Ayn Rand uses it, idea is a very general term. It can stand for a concept, a proposition, any intellectual manifestation. Concept stands specifically for an integration of concrete in the form of a word. One word is a concept. That's a technical term. And notion, I copied Ms. Rand in this, is the word we use for ideas we do not like. <laughs> but that is not, uh, nobody has to follow that usage. It's a way, it's a disdainful, pejorative way of referring to I, an idea. Now, Listen to this one. Tell me what you would answer. Normally talking to people, they are in favor of religion because it offers a morality. How should one talk to such people in terms of objectivism? Tell them there is such a thing as a rational morality. Tell them that religion is not the source of morality, but the enemy of morality. That religion has had thousands of years to uh, propagate itself, with uh, the entire stranglehold on the culture, and instead of making people moral, it led to barbarism, the medieval and the dark age period, and it was only recovering from religion at all that got the West into a civilized frame of mind, and maybe they should give up the idea that religion comes from the supernatural and consider that there's something in the actual reality that requires us to behave a certain way. But uh, I don't know what else you could say to uh, uh, such people, but perhaps I'll use this to segue into, what are we doing for time? Um, several people asked me, uh, I thought of this in connection with uh, the que question on religion. Uh, in regard to Dr. Locke's discussion of the denial of evil, uh, were there any other philosophic ideas that I would want to uh, throw into the pot uh, with regard to explaining uh, the denial of evil. And of course, a lot, you could say an awful lot of things. Every bad idea will lead them there one way or the other, but there are certainly two I would be happy to mention. Um, one is altruism as such, and more particularly the New Testament. Uh, I think that uh, when you have a civilization founded on the uh, thesis that virtue consists of resisting not evil, of turning the other cheek, of loving your enemies, of forgiving them no matter uh, what they do, and that you, you positively get virtue for embracing evil. And at the same time, the same religion and the same document tells you, who are you to judge? You are evil if you judge. You're given a twofold injunction. Love the wicked and don't dare call them wicked. Love them because they're wicked, but don't identify it. And this is accepted as the essence of virtue. Now, I, I truly believe that without this, it would be impossible to evade evil on the scale of today. These people feel virtuous in doing it. Even the atheists and the secular ones among them have entirely absorbed the idea of the Christian forgiveness and compassion and pity and mercy as being the essence of virtue. And therefore, when they deny that someone is evil on the deepest level, they feel that they're doing something moral. They consider justice wicked. Uh, that is the acknowledgment of someone's uh, uh, evil. And uh, to me, this is a very crucial uh, uh, thing. It's a form of self-sacrifice that is deeply embedded in Western culture. Uh, uh, and it's, it's particularly Christianity. So here I'm coming down from the Olympian 
a height of denouncing all religion impartially to take a, 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 an attack specifically on Christianity, which in this regard is very, very corrupt, very corrupt. I'll go further than that. I don't think there would be skepticism or relativism or any of these epistemological theories that we're swamped with today if it wasn't for the Bible, because they all get, uh, they get away with it by counting on humility as a virtue. They start with the idea that it's a noble thing to say, who am I? I can't accomplish anything. I'm nothing. We're all nothing. And then, of course, they're all ripe for some skeptic to tell them, well, that just applies to cognition. You can't, you're no good at any field. You're no good at this one, too. Uh, it's not an accident uh, that the Greeks preached pride, or at least Aristotle did, and the Christians preached humility. But I, I do believe that there are profound ways in which we never have recovered from the Middle Ages, never have begun to regain the cultural uh, legacy that the ancients had, that we'll all live and die, and our grandchildren will live and die, never knowing the kind of atmosphere that the Greeks and Romans took for granted. And this is because of the poisonous consequences of specifically Christianity. All mysticism, but what has ruined the West, is Christianity. So don't get me started on that. I used to be much calmer about Christianity until I started writing about the virtue of justice. And I got myself into a complete lathered frenzy against Christianity in the process. <laughs> Oh, yes, I wanted to add in, though, that it's not just Christianity, because, after all, in the medieval times, there was an attempt to identify sinners. So a lot of the things that Dr. Locke said are very relevant to the transmuting of Christianity into the specifically modern form. But the one thing I do want to throw in is nihilism. Modern nihilism, the hatred of the good, is very essential to refusing to see the evil because if you don't want, if you want to destroy the good, the first thing you want to do is not see it. You won't want to tell yourself this is good. You want to evade the whole issue of uh, morality and therefore you want to stand on your head to refuse to make distinctions between uh, good and evil. So I think there's a very, very destructive and evil motivation. It's a killer who doesn't want to know the value of what he's killing and therefore simply wipes out uh, any knowledge of value and militantly excludes it from his consciousness. Okay, I just threw that into the pot, so to speak. Now, here's one. I, I just couldn't resist commenting on this. I, I'll try to take this straight without making any pejorative remarks. Could a commune work if everyone in it was an Aristotelian? A commune, you know, like a social collective where everyone lived in a collectivist society. But they were all Aristotelians. Could it therefore work? What do you think of that one? How many think the answer is yes? You're right. <laughs> what would they do with their Aristotelianism? Suppose they say, okay, I believe in the laws of logic and I believe in the validity of the senses and I don't care, whatever else you want to throw in that was Aristotelian, I'm going to form concepts by abstraction and so on and so on. The only thing is the conditions of life are no individual can function except by permission of the group as embodied in the leader. No one has access to any piece of property except by the leader's permission. You can't get a book, you can't write, you can't talk, you can't meet. Everything is prescribed by the group and the leader. Now the leader's got the best intentions in the world. He's an Aristotelian. Only he wants as he sees it, and that's not what you see. After all, our disagreements possible between people. What happens then? You have to have a club down on your head because you're getting in the way of the commune. Now there is, there is no distinction, no, no dichotomy between mind and body. You can't say, suppose our minds are in great shape, but our bodies are enslaved. What happens then? You're wiped out? The purpose of the mind is to guide your action. If you're put in a position where free action is no longer possible, free thought is no longer of any significance. You may as well just quit thinking, which is just exactly what they do in Russia. They escape into chess or across the border or into alcoholism or into anything because thought, even if they did think, they can't do anything with it. Their lives are completely enslaved. So there's no dichotomy as though, oh, I'd be happy Aristotelians and now we can get together and do anything socially. 
This is why freedom is a requirement of human life, because it's a requirement of thought. And if you don't have it, it doesn't make any difference what philosophy you, you accept then. How do you distinguish the concept reality from the concept existence? Well, existence is the basic concept. You see, we're just jumping wildly here from politics to metaphysics and all over the place. <clears throat> existence is the basic concept. It's the one we discussed. Reality is a special perspective on existence. Reality is existence as correctly perceived by man. In many contexts, of course, the two terms are synonymous. But you can, for instance, say such and such was not real to me. You can say such and such didn't exist to me. It existed or it didn't exist. But to say it's not real to you is to say I didn't yet grasp or integrate this phenomenon. It hasn't penetrated my consciousness. And in that sense, reality is a term describing the relation between the mind and reality, and existence is the pure metaphysical term. But of course, there are many contexts where you use them uh, synonymously. But some people in this room, I say this without criticism, but I can't satisfy the desire, have a passion for a philosophical dictionary. And they would like me to take every word either used by or possibly used by any philosopher and start with A and give a definition right to Z. And that is something I can't do in a question period, or probably even in real life either. I, I mean, I can define the key terms that I use, but uh, there is such a thing as a dictionary of synonyms, which will list 15 synonyms and tell you, in English, this is the shade of distinction between this one and this one. And I use those continuously when I write. If I'm not sure, I have a, a thesaurus, and a dictionary of synonyms, now I don't mean all, every word, but when necessary, I consult that, uh, I couldn't get along without those, because I'm not by any means always clear. There's, English has an abundant vocabulary, tremendous because it has so many roots. There's, there's like two Englishes, the, the Anglo-Saxon English and the Latin English, and uh, uh, there's therefore tremendous range of synonyms, uh, and uh, if you're interested in that, that is not philosophy. That, go to a dictionary. That, that exists in abundance. Get a hold of the Oxford English Dictionary and just read that. That'll hold you for a couple of years. <coughs> I have other questions. Yes, Jerry. You're not now teaching. Uh, is that because you're primarily working on your book? And when you finish your book, do you have plans to go back into it? Am I, why am I not teaching? I'm not teaching because no university will employ me. Which is about the simplest answer that I can give to you. Uh, as soon as um, <clears throat> my connections and my views uh, become known, I'm unemployable. I've been told that outright uh, by several people. And of course, now the issue of age comes in even if uh, I didn't have uh, uh, the problem of my ideology, I would be considered too old to be employed today because with the tenure and all the rest of it, they wouldn't hire somebody that close to retirement. So uh, that is a simple question. If I could get a decent job, I would certainly take it. Uh, but uh, I can't, so I just have to accept the fact and you know, occasionally do some kinds of seminars or lectures or whichever. I do like writing, but ideally I would like to combine writing and teaching. Unfortunately, not in this uh, current setup. It's part of the reason why I'm as bitter as I am uh, about today's universities and the pretense that they are open to a wide variety of views when they tell you in so many words. That doesn't make any difference what your credentials, your scholarship, none of it makes any difference that certain views are outrightly barred. And they know that in those words. Uh, the whole thing is such a gigantic fraud that uh, I don't even want to get started on that. Do I have another question? Yes. In what ways does Ayn Rand deal specifically with the issue of her own mortality or own non-existence in the final days of her life? How did Ayn Rand deal with the issue of her own mortality in the final days of her life? Well, I don't know what <clears throat> you would take. She was very ill in the final days of her life, very weak. She was in and out of consciousness. Uh, I can only say that she knew she was dying because she told it to her um, 
housekeeper who flew in uh, from uh, South America to be at her bedside at the end, her companion, her friend, Eloise. And the first thing she said to her was, I'm dying. So she was t entirely knowledgeable of it. She was conscious of signing over a power of attorney to me, and she knew you know, for checks and so on that she was signing it over because she was at the end. So uh, she wasn't always entirely clear. There was one point a couple days before she died where she agreed she, she seemed to lose the knowledge and agreed to uh, do something that couldn't reach its culmination publicly for another nine months, uh, uh, publishing the book Philosophy Who Needs It, and I asked her, she said, no, that's okay, well, I want to read to make sure it's right when it comes out, and it seemed to imply that she did not know entirely right at the end, but within that last period she knew, she took it very calmly. Uh, she did not, uh, she, for even years earlier, you may remember, uh, at a Ford Hall, so, several years before she died, she felt that her life work was completed, that she had done what she wanted. And someone in a question period at Fort Hall asked her, this was, uh, what, three, four or more, about three years before she died, asked her uh, a question, and she said, that is your problem now. I'm, I'm in effect, finished her. I've retired. And uh, she really did mean that. She had accomplished, done what she wanted, and... Uh, not that she courted suicide, but she did not regard it as uh, certainly didn't invoke panic or tragedy or anything like that. It was just a sort of a calm acceptance of what she knew was inevitable, and here it was. Now, that's the best I could say. <clears throat> I mean, that I can remember on that point. It's very hard to go from that to some of these abstract questions. All right, maybe somebody can bridge this gap here. Yes. You've already asked four today, haven't you? Now let me give somebody else a chance. You must have had... <laughs> yes, over here. Yes. Uh, you know, here the, uh, the idea that civilization grew out of the uh, absolutism and implicit and monotheism, <coughs> and specifically Judaism and Christianity. What do you think of that? I think it's fantastic. What do you think of the idea that civilization grew out of the, absolutism. the absolutism of Judaism and Christianity? Well, I mean... <laughs> Well, I think of that. I think the decline of civilization grew out of uh, Judaism and Christianity, as I indicated. Judaism and Christianity are absolutist only in the intrinsic sense, in the sense of dogmatist. There are so many commandments and so many laws and so many rules given or decreed by God and revelations and so on, and you simply have to accept them on faith. That is the opposite of civilization. That is what plunges you into the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, or primitivism. And the Greeks, by contrast, were a highly advanced civilization that's never been equaled in terms of the quality of the civilization. And they regarded very correctly these, what you now consider religion, mystery cults, and that all this mysticism mongering as beneath contempt. Uh, the worst ones were the Orphics in ancient Greece, you know, that influenced Pythagoras and through him uh, Plato, and they were looked at, uh, you know, with real contempt by the ordinary educated uh, people at the time. So, I mean, I couldn't think of a more fantastic statement than to ascribe civilization to Judaism or Christianity. Um, somebody else. Haven't you already asked three? All right, yeah. How do you get volition as a corollary from consciousness? Well, I said that once, so I'll just have to repeat briefly. How do you get volition as a corollary of consciousness? Simply by the fact that a conceptual consciousness must be volitional, or else it couldn't acquire any knowledge. Therefore, in the act of introspecting a conceptual consciousness, you have to be able to detect the faculty of choice. A conceptual consciousness is not automatic, and if anyone claimed it was, he would invalidate his own consciousness via the issue of determinism. And therefore, you can show that if you deny volition, you're denying consciousness. And because you're a volitional consciousness, when you look in, you don't just see consciousness, you see yourself choosing. And in that way, it is a corollary. But this reminds me of another question. Um, did I mean to imply by the chart I had on the board that consciousness as such was inherent in existence because everything was a derivative of existence? And the answer to that is no. That's a good clarification. 
it is conceivable that there would be a universe in which all consciousness was extirpated, in which there simply was no consciousness. All inanimate things are living things on the order of vegetables. So you cannot, quote, deduce or derive consciousness from the fact of reality. If you observe uh, Ayn Rand's wording, it is, um, existence exists, and in the act of grasping this statement, two corollaries are implied. Something exists which one perceives, and that one exists possessing consciousness. It is not the sheer fact of existence that leads to consciousness. It's your ability to grasp, to be aware of, to perceive that implies consciousness. And in that way, you cannot derive everything uh, from existence. Consciousness is, is not metaphysically necessarily inherent in reality as such. Um, I'm going to end. I got a couple of minutes on a few more personal questions that were handed in, uh, just because they were handed in. And uh, I wanted to say a word or two. How has your life changed with having a child positively and negatively? What made the biggest impact on you? Well, in, in a word, the, I'll give you the negative and the positive for a uh, second. Negative first. The negative, which I had never imagined, was how much work it is. I never, ever would have believed how much work it is in terms of time, effort, and pain in the back. Uh, the positive is, I would never have believed how much pleasure it is, how absolutely uh, wonderful it is. People had told me for years, you have to have one to know. And of course, I always said, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, I can abstract and so on, I know. <laughs> but, and as a matter of fact, and I don't say other people can't, but I was completely lacking, or almost completely lacking in the ability to concretize the tremendous joy that this process uh, entailed. So from this point of view, I'm a staunch advocate of parenthood now, and I really regret that I didn't do it about 25 years ago. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, I couldn't with my wife being the age she is, so it's maybe just as good that I waited. <clears throat> That's a quick answer to what surprised me. Those two things surprised me. Now, I have a very nice compliment here um, that it seems uh, improperly, uh, improper to read it, but I don't know how else to ask the question. But basically, it comes down to well, I'll read it. But. The precision and clarity of your lectures and writing are well documented and continuously discussed. That is news to me that it's good. <laughs> <clears throat> and then the person goes on to ask various hypotheses as to what explains this. Were there specific skills you practiced to develop this uh, ability? I don't know, it may be bad taste even to discuss this. I don't mean to be praising myself, but I did get this question, whether you believe me or not, in a number of different forms. And in fact, one person said, I attended a lecture of yours in the 60s, which was pretty bad. You're much better now. Who is your acting coach? <coughs> <laughs> and I got a number that were not quite as uh, like that, but I. Maybe I should just conclude by making a, a brief uh, uh, comment in this regard. Obviously, I couldn't recapitulate a whole epistemology here. But uh, I brought really one thing to the study of objectivism, which was a really tremendous motivation. Uh, I knew at the start, when I was 18, approximately 18 or 19, that this was going to be a, an issue of decades before I would really understand this in a way that was satisfactory to me. And I accepted that as a life work. And uh, that I, I give myself the credit for picking this philosophy, for knowing how much work it would take, and for sticking to it. But now beyond that, of course, I, I wasn't stupid. But beyond that, I'd like to give a lot of credit here to um, Ayn Rand, because you would really have to go some not to get a lot from dealing with her as closely as I did for all those years. She really taught me everything uh, in the course of the years in one form or another. If you made some casual statement that wasn't on the mark, 
she told you in detail what it implied and so on and how it connected. And if you had any question how A integrated to B and you asked her at midnight, you were still finding out at 5 in the morning. <laughs> and I rushed home to make notes and so on. Uh, so uh, I don't want to be improperly modest, but I do want to say that uh, I really think I had an invaluable uh, training that is just simply unobtainable in the world uh, and that I was privileged to have. If anybody asks me the question, one of these questions involve, well, what could I, what did you specifically do to improve aside from learning epistemology and so on? The two most helpful things were teaching and writing. Uh, <clears throat> I can't recommend either enough to you if you want to expand your ability as a thinker, a lecturer, a writer, whatever. Teaching I found very valuable, and I did teach uh, for 17 years in a formal way, particularly being bombarded by questions from all different contexts and perspectives and being continuously stumped. You know, when I started the teaching at Hunter College in 1957, I never knew the answer to any question. And whenever they asked, I'd try to remember, what was it that I read or what could possibly, and then I would go home. And these things would prey on me, I'd write them down, or I would ask Ayn Rand, and even then I didn't get it straight, but I always followed this method. Whenever I wasn't satisfied, and that is true to this day with my answer to some question, if I thought there's something that's not entirely clear there, I would immediately devote my attention to what is it, how can I straighten it out. And some, some of these things went on for decades. But uh, if you try to explain an idea to a group and follow, try to answer their questions, you will be amazed, first of all, how much is unclear that you think is clear until you hear the kind of questions they ask you and it never occurred to you that that confusion could exist and then you get sucked into that confusion yourself. So it, you, it's a tremendous learning device. The other and even better is writing if you have an editor. That is to say, an editor who will hold you to the wording that you use. Now, I had the world's greatest, which was Ayn Rand. She read even my undergraduate term papers in philosophy, let alone you know, serious writing like the ominous parallels or essays and so on. And if you ever went through a single editorial session with her, uh, it is, was completely unrepeatable because she caught everything and hierarchically. <clears throat> Two. In other words, she wouldn't just say this comma is wrong and so on. She would give you first an overall assessment of, like, say, a, a chapter that I would give her from the ominous parallels. What was basically right or what was basically wrong? And then how that was implemented on the next level, and you get the whole framework, how it tied into other errors that you made and how the good points, uh, you know, uh, could be developed this way and that way. And then she'd start from the beginning. And by now, you have such a context that already you would have rewritten the thing differently. But she found many more details illustrating this broad thing. She had such a phenomenal ability that from reading the first couple of sentences, where you're just introducing, where you're basically saying, all I'm going to do now is talk about x, she could say, well, if you put it this way, that is going to commit you to such and such. And at first, I was astounded because the such and such didn't happen for 20 pages. And she would guess it from the beginning. Finally, I came to acquire that skill, more or less, from watching her. If you can find an editor that will hold you to objective precision, then the best thing I can, do in the, that I can recommend to you is write out anything you want to understand and then have it edited. And if you can't find such an editor, then wait a week and come back and look at it with a skeptical and cool glance and see whether it stands or it doesn't, because that does not equal the training that I had, but if you have to do it, that's better than nothing. Those are the two things which I did for 30 years or longer. And uh, if you're kind enough to think that they paid off, I want to thank you for the compliment and uh, declare this over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.